We are starting a new, brand new series. We'll see how many weeks it goes. It might just be this week, depending on whether or not there are more questions. questions. All right, and the question box. Um, tonight we're dealing with a specific question. The person who wrote this question will see that almost any guy does not look like the question they asked because their question took up two of the blue sheets front and back, and I cannot fit it on here. But these questions get to the heart of their question and help me explain. I'll give some more details to the actual question as we kind of talk about. It. Um, but really, the setup verse. The reason that we even get this question is Deuteronomy 22.10. And so I think this is going to shed a lot of light on understanding this. So reading this, it says, You must not plow with an ox and a donkey harnessed together. <laughs> the Lord of the Word, the Word of the Lord has spoken. Thank you. Did everyone get that? Yes. Amen. Let's go home. I just thought it was funny to okay. Preach. Ah, I'm going out. Uh, Preach. All right. So this is in Deuteronomy. Uh, it's actually part of the uh, the law there that they're not supposed to plow with an ox and a donkey. Practically speaking, because they're different heights, they have different strengths. They won't be able to plow together in a straight line. Your field will not be plowed very well at all. Now. That's what it means to be unequally yoked. So if anyone's ever told you, you can't date that person, you'll be unequally yoked. Never heard that. Well, now you're going to hear it. You are, uh, that's kind of what they're referring to. There's a New Testament passage that we're going to get into. But the question is, why can I date a good non-Christian? What does this Bible say not to be unequally yoked? All right, the passage we're going to look at is in 2 Corinthians. Let's do this. Uh, chapter 6, uh, going to the first part of chapter 7. Before we get there, um, if you ever heard uh, dating non Christian means you're unequally yoked, meaning you're, uh, you've got uh, two different kind of natures of people and trying to combine together and it'll never work out. Um, people say things like, if it's not rooted in Jesus, it'll never work out. Um, you know, it's, they're going to treat you bad. Um, you know, your relationship's going to be miserable. They say all these kinds of things um, as reasons why you shouldn't date a non-Christian. Why is it bad for to date a non-Christian? And the question is, why, why can't I date a good non-Christian? Um, like some people make out everyone who's not a Christian to be like a horrible serial killer. They're going to, you know, pull out your fingernails and do horrible things to you. And that's just not true. There are moral non-Christians. Okay? Um, there are moral atheists. Right? There are people who don't believe in God who live moral lives. They're immoral atheists. They're immoral Christians. Right? You can go in any religion and find somebody who's doing something wrong. Okay? Just like you can go to any like non-religion and find somebody who's doing something right. Okay? Um, and so kind of the first two reasons we're going to look at is most of the time what you hear when people say this is why you shouldn't be unequally of the reasons they give. Um, and I want to expose them for what they are as non-biblical reasons. All right, they're rooted in human philosophy that has crept into the American evangelical church. And that's why I give our little popular evangelical reasons not to be unequally yoked. Um, if you don't know what evangelical means, as Southern Baptists, we would be grouped into evangelical class because we... Um, evangelize. We share the gospel. It is our goal to convert people to Christianity. We think that everyone should be a Christian, so we are labeled evangelicals because we are very mission-oriented. Um, other Protestant denominations and even non-denominational non -denominational churches are grouped within evangelicalism. So that's what that word means. Um, the first kind of reason people give is um, really rooted in existentialism. All right, that's, what that, that's how you pronounce that word, existentialism. Look at the root word, exist. All right, and it is a kind of a modern philosophy that's developed in the past um, 200 years that says it's the belief that humans are completely free. They're completely free. I mean completely free. Okay, now, Christian view of freedom 
means that we're free to an extent because we still have obligations to others, the world, and society. Right? We're not free to do whatever we want. There's limitations. We recognize that. But existentialism says humans are completely free in a universe with no knowable right or wrong. So you're completely free. There's no absolute morality. All right? And so the number one question an existentialist is going to ask is, what will make me happy? What will make me happy? And so that's why you see most of the great existentialist thinkers pursue pleasure. Um, Oscar Wilde is a great example. All right, if you've run across him in class yet, in college definitely will and take a lit class. Um, he, he was not a moral person, but his novels were incredibly moral because it was all about existentialism that showed the end of it. You know, when you only pursue pleasure and only pursue, pursue pleasure and you find emptiness. And so existentialism says, what will make me happy? And so some Christians take that and they say, you won't be happy if you date a non-Christian. Because they're going to drag you down, and they're, they're going to talk about God with you, um, they're going to make your life miserable, they're going to be mean to you because they don't love Jesus, and everyone who doesn't love Jesus is a horrible, mean person. And they're going to say, you're not going to be happy. That's why you shouldn't be unequally yoked, because you won't be happy. That's the reason they give. All right? I think that is an insufficient reason. The next one is rooted in pragmatism. When you see the word pragmatism, think practical. Okay? Pragmatism is all about function equals truth. And so the question that they want to ask is, what works best? What works best? So a pragmatist is not bound by any kind of moral, morality or any kind of philosophy, any belief system whatsoever. They just look at the situation and they say, what's going to work here? And that kind of sounds like, that sounds like, that's okay. And so you get to the, you know, Important questions with like, you know, like let's look at our health care system. Let's look at why health care costs have risen so much. Well, it's because we have a large increase in the elderly. And people's life expectancy is growing up. They're living longer. They need more care. Well, how do we solve that? Well, pragmatists can look at that and say, well, let's just kill all of them. No more old people. No more dragging down the system. We save lots of money. Easy for everybody. And that's completely okay for them. But as Christians, we're like, that's morally reprehensible. We don't kill people. We don't kill innocent people. That is not cool at all. Practice says, no, that's the best solution. Let's do that. So Christians look at it pragmatically and they say, well, it's not going to work out. You're coming in with different values. You're coming in with different ways to solve problems. You're looking at the world through different lenses. And so the relationship won't last. It won't work, so you shouldn't enter into it. I also think that is an insufficient reason. And so those are really the two big ones you're going to hear. No one is really, I've never heard anyone give the real reason of why this unequally yoked thing is even in Scripture. All right, and that is a throwback to the King James. King James Version is one who said unequally yoked. Your modern, our modern translation is probably not going to say that. Um, so we are going to actually look at the passage this phrase comes out of in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses, verse 14 through chapter 7, verse 1. So turn to 2 Corinthians. Verse 14, we're going to read all the way to chapter 7, verse 1. All right, so it says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. Literally, don't be unimpolite. Okay, that's what's there in the first. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. Let us work toward complete holiness, because... We fear God. 
In this passage, Paul starts asking a bunch of questions. And he states a bunch of opposites. He says, how can light live with darkness? Right? You either have light or you have darkness. You know, you know, how can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can there be harmony between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? See, these are all things that don't go together by nature. They're opposites. The same is true with Christians and non-Christians. Um, when we're looking at these contexts of marriage. And then it says, as God said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be their my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. I will be your father, you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 7 says, because we have these promises, dear friends. And so, we have to look at, alright, it says we've got promises from God. We have to look at what is the promise. What is God promising us? He promises us himself. Promises us himself. Alright, because he says, I will live among them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Alright, therefore, come out from among unbelievers, separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. So God says, come out from them because I'm giving you myself. He says, I'm holy. Therefore, I'm setting you apart to be my special people. You are going to also be holy. That's what holy means, being set apart. That's why I wanted to look at the Old Testament, right? The reason we have the book of Leviticus, guys, is because God is communicating, I want you to be set apart. You are my special people. I want you to be set apart. That's why there's stuff in Leviticus, Leviticus that says you can't put two different kinds of fabric together. It's not because God hates different types of fabric being put together. Okay? It's not because he has like a grudge against polyester or linen versus cotton. Right? It's because God is saying, look, you're supposed to be separate. You're supposed to be set apart. You're my special people. You are my temple. Someone who doesn't acknowledge me as God isn't going to come and worship me in my temple. I'm not going to dwell in them as they're not going to be my temple. And so you should join yourself to them. You should bind yourself to them. Alright? God tells us to be set as heart because our nature has changed. Our nature has changed. We are now, we're in Christ for righteousness. We're no longer sinful. We're no longer dead to God. We're alive to Him. We're no longer fleshly, alright, of the world. Now, we're of the Spirit. Our nature has changed. All right? Just like a cat and a dog can't have babies, can't join them together and produce anything. The same should be true with Christian and non-Christian. They shouldn't be joined together simply because Christian's nature is opposite of a non-Christian's. These reasons are theological. All right? They're theological. T-H-E-O-L-O. G-I-C-A-L. Theological. Theology, what we know about God. Talking about theological, this is, this is because of what we know about God, what God tells us about Himself, affects how we live our lives and how we make our decisions. Alright, so when it says don't be unequally yoked, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about because who we are in Christ, God is saying, I set you apart for a special purpose. You're my temple, you're my child, Bear my spirit. You are righteousness now. Therefore, I don't want you joining with unrighteousness. No matter how nice they are, no matter how friendly they are, no matter how attractive they are, no matter how good they treat you, I don't want you joining with them because you're mine. Because of who I am. Now to us, that probably doesn't sound very satisfactory. We like the existentialist and the pragmatic versions of things because we've been steeped in that. But to God, the theological reasons are the most important. And so the whole unequally yoked things, it's not about are they nice to you? 
Okay? Guys, ladies, you're going to date Christian guys who are jerks. Okay? They're just going to be complete jerks who are going to treat you like crap. Hopefully you won't do that, but you can. Guys, you're going to date Christian girls who have no reflection of Christ whatsoever. They will be manipulative and petty, and they will make your life miserable. And then you might see a non-Christian girl who's the opposite of that, who's kind and compassionate and genuine. And you'll say, what is wrong with me being joined to this? Isn't this a better option? But God says, hey, you know, I want you to be joined to something godly, so if you don't see that, then don't join. Just don't join up. Um, you know, the concept of dating is foreign to scripture. It's fairly new, so it doesn't talk about dating. No one tells you the Bible talks about dating, American dating, is lying to you because it doesn't. Okay, it gives us like who to look for, and it gives us yeah. principles, and it gives us, you know, courses of action just in any shot you should take, but it doesn't address American dating. So when we get into who should I date, um, you know, I can't answer that for you, but I can tell you that God does not want us to be bound together with unbelievers. Even though it may appear for a time that it's okay, it's not a big deal. You know, apart from the theological reason, guys, um, your relationships in high school and stuff aren't marriages. Or how much you feel like you love the person or you like the person or how close you are, it's not a marriage. It's never the equivalent. Your relationships are never the equivalent of a marriage. Never. It will never be like that. Even if you cohabit with somebody, that is not the equivalent of a Christian marriage. And I guarantee you, every person I've ever met in the church who's been married to a non-believing spouse has had a good marriage. But they've always, the Christian in the marriage has always been heartbroken because the non-Christian have anything to do with church, with God. They carry this huge weight and this huge burden. But they're treated fine. But it's just it's this like this bag of sorrow they just carry around. And so right now it might look okay. But I guarantee you that it's going to start to matter. The theology is going to come out. You guys, a non-Christian isn't going to understand this at all. If you're dating a non-Christian and you break up with them and you say, well, you know, I've been reading my Bible and it says that I'm not supposed to be bound together with a non-Christian and so that's why I'm breaking up with you and they're like, am I mean to you? Do I treat you bad? You don't like me anymore? And you're like, no, it's none of that. It's just I want to follow the Word of God. They're not going to understand that. That's not going to be satisfactory. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes being a Christian isn't satisfying to other people or every desire we have. But as Christians, we're more concerned about truth and obedience than we are about what feels right or about the opinions of other people. Uh, truth is not what works. Truth is straight from the mouth of God. Um, so, to kind of answer this question, why can't I date a good man Christian? It's probably to say, not to be unequally yoked, because we're God's special possession. He promises us himself. And for a Christian, that should be enough. Even if it means you don't date anybody, because you don't see anybody worth dating. Okay, but you still got Christ. You still got, and I'm not saying make Jesus your boyfriend or anything like that. You have got the best thing in the history of the universe that will ever be, because you have God Himself. And that is the ultimate uh, fulfillment for any person, Christian or non Christian. Um, and so that is why it says, don't be unequally yoked. And that is the Christian, the Orthodox Christian reason not to bind ourselves to non-Christians. 
All right? You'll find a bunch of other ones out there, but those aren't orthodox. Those are heavily influenced with human philosophies. Uh, whether, you know, people want to realize that or admit it or not. So it gave us a takeaway, um, which is 2 Corinthians 7, 1. It just says, because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. Let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. Um, that's true, you know, of tons of stuff in our life, not just boyfriends, girlfriends, right? Um, so this is a great verse to pray over yourself. Because there's a lot of stuff that we have in our lives that we're just not aware is ungodly. We're just, we don't realize it, and we need the Holy Spirit to kind of bring it to our attention. So continually praying this verse says, Hey, Holy Spirit, I'm serious about being set apart for God, so bring these things to my attention that I don't need anymore. Because it could be as simple as, you know, you're listening to some music with some bad messages that you haven't caught on to yet. Um, you know, you've got some toxic friendships. Um, you've got, you know, you're treating your parents poorly, uh, your siblings poorly. You need to apologize to somebody. You're holding on to unforgiveness. Um, you know, you've got a lead foot behind the wheel of your car. You know, all kinds of things. All right, the Holy Spirit can bring this. So I just challenge you to pray this verse over yourself and say, all right, God, I want, I want you to do this in me so I can set apart for you and for you only. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that answer make sense? Kind of clear? Um, so, as with, whenever you ask a question and I answer it, if you have more questions after that, or you feel like that was a good answer, um, you can feel free to approach me afterwards, um, and we can talk about it more. Um, that is always good. Uh, so I'm going to pray for us.